You are listening to episode 70 of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about once a day cooking. This is something that I do in the fall. It's the best time of year to do it. You can adapt certain principles of this in any season really, but fall just lends itself so well to once a day cooking. It's really great if you have a family you're trying to take care of or if you homeschool. This is a way to get the cooking done for the day in the morning so that you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the day. And it's something that we love doing and do often all season long. This episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast is sponsored by Berkey Water Filters. We have had our Berkey Water Filter sitting on our counter for about 10 years now. When we were on city water back in our last house, it gave me such peace of mind to know that the Berkey was filtering out all of the viruses and bacteria, the chlorine, the taste is just amazing. Even here in our new farmhouse, we are on well water. We still use the Berkey. We've gotten used to the pure taste of water that you get from a Berkey water filter that is nothing like any of the other filters I've tried. I chose the Berkey water filter because of how many things and toxins that it filters out, but also the filter cost. It was the most economical system per gallon that I could find on the market, and I've been a happy customer ever since. Berkey has partnered with me and given me a special discount just for Simple Farmhouse Life podcast listeners. You can find the bundle deals that they have put together just for you over at bit.ly slash farmhouse Berkey. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash farmhouse Berkey, B-E-R-K-E-Y, all one word. So get in on the bundle deal while they're still in stock. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. So if you listen to episode eight of this podcast, one of my very first episodes way back in January of this year, I talked about how I meal plan and it's called How I Meal Plan From Scratch Food the Easy Way, which essentially I talk in that episode about how I don't meal plan and I focus on seasonally available foods. I have some cooking skills in my arsenal and I basically just throw things together. This is my no stress way of doing cooking the healthy way because for me, meal planning always felt very confining and like something that stressed me out more than helped. And so that is back in episode eight. Eight. In today's episode, I am going to be talking along the same principles, the same type of cooking, but some of the things that you can make in the fall that actually work really well for all day. So for once a day cooking. So soups and stews are probably the best thing that you can make. Essentially, I will just take some homemade bone broth, which I do by saving bones from cooking a whole chicken, or if I get a quarter of a steer or half a hog from a local farmer, if you request the bones from the butcher and you keep all of those, putting those in water in the instant pot on low pressure for several hours will yield some really beautiful bone broth. If you always have that in the fridge, you are really close to creating a delicious soup. When I do that, I will make double or triple and then just leave it on the back of the stove all day long so that we can pull from it if anybody is hungry during the day, for lunch, for dinner. And I also like to add a little bit of something to make it different at dinner time. So I'll go more into that. So my first thing that I love making for once a day cooking is chili. To make chili, I will take either ground beef or ground venison, which we are just now running out of the deer that we got last November during deer season here in Missouri, or sausage or a combination of the two. So I'll do half ground venison and then half sausage. This really just helps to add a little bit of fat because venison is so lean that it just, sometimes isn't as good for that reason. So I'll do two pounds of venison, one pound of sausage, add two or three diced onions, a whole bulb of garlic or more minced, and brown the meat with the garlic and onion. 
add salt, add pepper, and then I add that to either three or four cans of diced tomatoes or if you have any saved from your garden or you're still getting tomatoes if it hasn't frosted where you are, diced bell peppers, chili powder, salt, pepper to taste, and then a little bit of broth to dilute it down a little bit. And then I cook some black beans in my Instant Pot for about 30 minutes to 45 minutes on high pressure. Now sometimes I will cook my black beans in broth just to add more broth and sometimes just water if I don't have a ton. I combine all of that in my cast iron Dutch oven. Now I love using my cast iron Dutch oven for once a day cooking because it holds the heat so well because it's so heavy that I can use the simmer function on my stove which on my old 1949 caloric this is just a tiny center flame and with the way that the heavy cast iron traps the heat, it keeps it at a really nice simmer all day long. Now occasionally I will turn it off because you know it could overcook, but I will leave that going with this big pot of chili all day. Now if we want to stretch it to three meals or if we've eaten so much at lunch and throughout the day that there's not quite enough for the dinner meal, my secret trick that I've been doing lately that is so good is I've been ordering in bulk from Jovial the Jovial einkorn pasta, the little spirals, and I'll cook up a whole box of that, add it to whatever chili is left, and then just add some shredded cheddar cheese. It is so good. That is probably the best way to eat chili. I actually would rather just skip the first part of the day where we're just eating chili and go straight to that. So you could also do that at a couple meals and make it stretch even further. Some things that we love to serve with chili are diced avocados with salt, organic tortilla chips are really good, sour cream, shredded cheese. Chili is my kids' favorite meal. They get so excited when they see that I've made chili. Pretty much any soup actually is a crowd pleaser for my kids. All right, another good option for once a day cooking is any kind of stew. Again with this, Add whatever vegetables are on sale, or if you came across some from a local farmer who, I don't know, sometimes we have people in our area who are giving us vegetables that are excess from their garden, or you know, we have Luke's uncle let us come pick apples from his tree, so now a lot of our breakfasts are revolving around apples, things like that. So anytime we come into something like that from a sale or a farmer or something, I like to just stop eating everything else and just focus on eating that seasonal item. That's one thing I love about the flexibility of not meal planning. But for stew, some of my favorite things to put in it. First, it uses up a whole lot more broth than a potato soup, a pumpkin soup, or a chili. So it's really good if you have a lot of broth you're trying to get rid of. I will just add to some broth my stew meat, chopped carrots, green beans, diced onions, lots and lots and lots of garlic, celery, and just whatever herbs we have dried or fresh, and then just let that simmer until everything is soft and the meat is falling apart. I find that the longer the meat sits at that slow simmer, the more tender it becomes, which makes it a perfect option for grass-fed beef as well. Sometimes I'll add corn or peas and then just enough salt and pepper to taste. And also some potatoes, I forgot about that, but potatoes are perfect in stew. Another variation of that same soup is cheeseburger soup. This is another favorite of my kids. I would say that they don't prefer the stew as much as this. We just do always have some stew meat in our uh, beef package that we get. So we will use that in that way. Also venison will do the same way, but cheeseburger soup. What I do first is I brown the meat just like I did for the chili with garlic and onion, salt, pepper. Sometimes I'll add a little cumin as well. Maybe some dried herbs like oregano, basil, thyme, that kind of thing, like a Herbs Day Province mix or Herbs Day. I was corrected recently on how to say this. Now I don't remember. Or an Italian seasoning works really great. Then I set the beef aside because I don't like to cook ground beef in with the vegetables. I used to do that and it just does not give it a very good flavor. You like to salt it and add the aromatics while browning. Then I remove it from my Dutch oven, add the broth, chopped potatoes, carrots, 
sometimes celery, but with the cheeseburger soup, I do like to stick to more of just the potato, so it's like a burger and fries type of thing. I'll cook those in the broth, add a lot of salt until it, they are soft, and then I add the browned meat back to it and serve it with lots of shredded cheese individually in each bowl and sour cream. It is so good. And it's easier for the kids to eat because it's ground meat versus stew. That's a crowd pleaser. Again, really delicious with diced avocados with salt. I'm actually getting hungry. I think I need to make this right now for the rest of today. We actually already have our once a day cooking going today with white chicken chili. So I'll probably have to do cheeseburger soup tomorrow, but it is one of our favorites. Okay, so the next one I'll talk about is white chicken chili. Again, cooking a lot of beans. Now I do like to pre-soak beans in water with some apple cider vinegar. This makes them more digestible. It helps to remove some of the anti-nutrients that are in beans that wraps the nutrients up that make them not as bioavailable. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I forget. So if I do forget, I just cook them at high pressure in my Instant Pot. Now I recently learned, this is apparently common knowledge and I did not know this, that you do not want to slow cook beans. Now I don't know if actually this has to do with all type of beans, but at least kidney beans. I read this, okay, so let me read this. This comes from motherwouldknow.com. Kidney beans should not be cooked from raw in a slow cooker. The scientific reason is that the beans contain a protein called, I am not gonna be able to say this, but I'll try, phytohymaglutinin. 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 Okay, who cares? Which is toxic. Slow cookers may not reach a high enough temperature and hold it for long enough to kill the toxin. So this is something that I never knew. Um, actually, I'm looking here at choosingvoluntarysimplicity.com and they say many dried beans, including kidney beans, should never be cooked solely in a crock pot or slow cooker. Um, again, talking about that same toxin. So this is not something I've done a ton of research on. This was brought to my attention recently. Thankfully, we've had the Instant Pot for quite a while. I don't know that I've ever slow cooked beans, but just in case that is something that would come up, if you're going to be doing a lot of once a day cooking, relying on beans with chilies and stews and things like that, um, just know that. So I will cook some white beans in the Instant Pot until they're cooked through. This usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour. I find that black beans cook a lot more quickly than the large white Great Northern beans. Um, and then I will add them to some broth. I'll add cooked chicken, whether I cooked it in the Instant Pot or maybe it was picked from the bone from the day before for a roasted chicken. If I want a really large batch, I will make a chicken for the sole purpose of making white chicken chili, and that's what I did last time I made it. And actually, this is already carrying over into another day of feeding us, which is great. We are not super picky or super worried about variety. Usually we get on kicks of something for a while. It's okay if we eat it for a few days. I actually know a mother who said that when, she, when her kids were little, she had a lot of kids that she would just make a huge amount of something and they would eat that all week. I guess I need a little bit more variety than that, but I'm totally cool with eating the same thing for three or four times in a row. So for the white chicken chili, I also add a whole bulb of garlic, three large bell peppers, at least diced, sweet corn, at least two onions, and then cumin, salt, pepper, fresh lime juice if I have it, and fresh chopped cilantro, again if I have it. I didn't have it today, so we're going without the cilantro. We also will add shredded cheese, diced avocado, and then to stretch it, if you get to a third meal and you need a little bit more, I like to make up some of my popcorn cornbread. So I mill popcorn in my Nutramil, which if you are brand new to my podcast and to my blog, I have episodes all about milling your own grains. But I one time got the idea to put popcorn through my mill and make a cornbread with it, and it actually turned out really good. So I have recipes over on my blog. If, in case you want a recipe, I have it for my popcorn cornbread, white chicken chili, and chili as well. And I believe the chili variety that I have on the blog, I even added diced pumpkin to, so that's an option as well. 
I will peel a pumpkin, scoop, cut it in half, scoop out the seeds, and then dice it and cook it just like any other squash and add that into my chili. And it makes a hearty, thick, nourishing chili that is so good. So you can get those all at farmhouseonmoon.com if you're looking for specific recipes. I don't have one for my stew, but that's just because it's just a whole bunch of veggies and meat and enough salt and pepper and herbs to make it taste wonderful. That also tastes really good paired with, if you make my artisan sourdough bread and add a bunch of butter, that really stretches a stew. And it's great too, because you could do a baking day in the beginning of the week, make up a whole bunch of bread, and then you have something to stretch all of your soup and stew meals throughout the week just by adding butter and bread. Another great once a day cooking meal is roast. To make that, I will just brown a roast in some butter in my Instant Pot on the saute function. And then I add onions and carrots and garlic and a little bit of broth and cook it on high pressure for about 60 minutes. I like to serve that with garlic mashed potatoes and then sometimes I'll even remove the roast and the veggies from the Instant Pot and thicken the drippings with some flour to make a gravy. So that's something that makes it taste even better. All right, I put a poll out, or not a poll, but a question box out on Instagram and ask what some of your favorite once a day cooking things are, if anybody else does this as well. And I got a lot of chili, so I think that's just a common one that people do. It's definitely one of our favorites. Recommendations on pot roast, which I also obviously agree with. Broccoli and cheddar soup. That is something that I've never made. I mean, I think I might've made it one time, but I need to get into that because we don't incorporate a whole lot of broccoli into our diets. So that's something I need to experiment with. Taco soup, that is also a good idea. I assume that you would take chicken, just like in the white chicken chili, cook cook a whole chicken in the Instant Pot or, or roast it in the oven, pick all the chicken from the bone, then add it to some broth with tomatoes, onions, peppers, garlic, I assume, maybe some cumin, top it with avocado, shredded cheese. I'm gonna look up a recipe and see, if, see what I'm missing here. Oh, corn, okay, corn, cilantro. Yes, it's a lot like the white chicken chili, but without the beans. Another good option is, actually a lot of people even add beans, but different ones like black beans. Another good option is to add some ground beef. It also is topped in some of these with raw diced red onion, which that sounds amazing. See, I wanna make this now. It's, it's really just a slight variation on, on the other soups that I make. So combining sort of the cheeseburger soup with the white chicken chili concept, so good. Another person says spaghetti and meatballs. You could do that, that sounds good. Um, I, I don't know if you could really leave it out and leave it simmering because the noodles would get overcooked, but I do like that idea for making a huge batch of spaghetti and meatballs and then just putting it in the fridge and pulling it right back out at dinner time really condenses the working time in the kitchen. All right, so I used to have a segment on this podcast where I shared one question from Instagram that I answered, and I haven't been doing that for a while, mostly because the question box was from such a long time ago. So I put a new one out on Instagram, and now I have a fresh batch of questions. So each podcast episode, I will spend some time at the end answering one of your questions. Okay, I think I've answered this one in some form, but I'll answer it again in case I haven't answered it specifically. Someone asked, what was the toughest transition between kids? One to two, five to six, etc." So this is something that a lot of moms, or some moms agree with me on, and some moms say, no way, it's not. It's the other way around. So I know that this is not the majority opinion, but I do know some moms who agree with me, so I'm not alone in this. But for me, it was for sure zero to one. And I don't know if it's because I just was so inexperienced with kids. I really didn't have, I mean, I had little sisters that were quite a bit younger than me, but I never had to be the one responsible for kids. And this, even my sister actually agrees with me. And she was a nanny for many years before she was a mom. And so she had all the experience in the world with kids. She took care of kids around the clock, cooked, cleaned, ran them places. I mean, she knew how to take care of kids and she had tons of experience with it. But still, even when she had her first child, it's the weight of their responsibility that you really weren't prepared for how 
huge that would be. Of course, there's a weight of love as well, but you just aren't quite prepared for how dramatic it all feels. At least that's how I felt. Also, I was not confident at all in what I was doing. I was listening to what everybody else said to do. I worried about absolutely everything. Things now that don't even cross my mind as a mom, things that don't even get a second thought, a moment of sleep lost, nothing at the time were huge. I remember calling the doctor constantly. I thought that every little thing I did was going to mess her up. I thought I had to potty train her at 18 months. I kid you not. I actually, I mean, this is embarrassing, but I read so many books that I thought I could potty train her when she was a complete infant. And I stressed about that. I thought that it made me a bad mom for not being able to do that. So for me, I guess because I read too many books, I listened to too many outside voices, had no confidence, I didn't know what I was doing as far as cooking and running a home. All of it was so overwhelming. For me, the first child was definitely the hardest. And it wasn't like I just remember that time as being so awful and it was just such a terrible, awful time. I didn't suffer from postpartum depression or anything, but it was definitely hard and I couldn't get anything else done besides taking care of my daughter. In a lot of ways, I can do so much, so much more now with six kids and even when I had four and five at home without Luke home with me, I could get so much more done. I had systems in place. I had confidence than I had with just the one child when I was just getting used to this whole thing. And I've let a lot go, a lot of perfectionism go. There is a mom I follow on Instagram and her handle is M is for mama. And she actually just birthed her ninth and 10th. It's her second set of identical twins. She just had them I believe today or yesterday as I'm recording this, but she gets asked this kind of question all the time because she has so many kids. And she said her biggest thing is they never think about what's it gonna be like to care for 10 kids or how are we gonna do it? She said that she always just takes each day as it comes, each challenge as it comes, and she doesn't think about it beforehand. And I relate to that so much. I don't have 10 kids, of course, so I'm nothing near what she's doing, but I relate to that so much in so many ways. I feel like the hardest part of a lot of things that we do, whether it's something as simple as swapping the kids clothes out for fall or cooking dinner or just anything, the building it up in our minds and the questioning of whether we're doing things right and thinking about how big of a job something's going to be is always a lot worse than the actual thing. It always sounds impossible, feels impossible, and like it's going to be a big thing. And then once you start doing it and once it's done, you realize it really wasn't. I don't know. I feel like it's like that with kids. Like she is eliminating the part where you overthink it and wonder if you can do it and how are we going to do it. Instead, just each day, it's like, okay, we've got this we have to do, let's tackle that. And with that mental, like not thinking about it beforehand and how hard it's going to be, it actually makes the entire thing less hard. So in the whole, which kid transition was the hardest thing. By the time I had my second, I was not worried about things. Like it was the same job. I had this newborn that needed to nurse all through the night, that needed to be changed, that cried when you put her down. It was the exact same job, but it felt easy. It really truly did because I embraced all of the things that for me make motherhood fun and enjoyable. I wore her around the clock in my Moby wrap. I put her with me in bed at night and I noticed that as long as, you know, she was fed and clothed that really nothing else mattered. And it got a little bit easier each time with each kid because of that, just not overthinking it. And like, and with each kid, there was always something that I was overthinking. And by the time you get down to Daniel, our sixth, I don't even, I mean, she, he's been going through a phase where he wakes up around 4.45 in the morning. And I remember with probably up to my third, fourth child, that would have been this life altering thing. Like, oh no, how am I going to fix this? He's going, he's waking up so early and I'm not getting enough sleep. And it was just this constant like stress and worry. And with Daniel, I have so many other things going on in my life. So many other kids, projects, home, homeschool. It's not something I think about until literally it's 4:45 and I'm getting up with him or Luke is, we take turns, but it's not this 
thing. It's just something that as it happens, I deal with it. And just, I don't know if this is, if this is coming off, like if this is making sense, but the not building it up in my head and researching, how are we going to fix this? And all of these worries and concerns, it just turns into not a big problem. I remember doing that with my second, literally all of my kids went through a phase where they woke up extremely early. It felt like this huge problem. And now on the other side of it, having five kids who are over the age of almost three. My fifth child is two and a half. I see that that phase just ends and there's really nothing you can do. People give you all of the tips like, you know, darken the room, do the noisemaker, put them to bed earlier, put them to bed later, stretch the late nap out to this time. I can tell you as a mom, none of those work. They just grow out of it. And so it's just to say that all of these worries and concerns that you have as a first time mom or maybe even second or third, once they go away, you just find this freedom that makes it not that difficult. So for me, zero to one for sure and progressively easier each time. Now that's not to say it's not really hard having six kids because it is, but a lot of those concerns that I had the first time around are gone and it makes the job not as hard or not exponentially harder than having one child. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. That was a really, really long answer, but I will stand by it. I've had so many moms tell me, no, it's one to two. That makes it exponentially harder. Zero to one's no problem. I disagree wholeheartedly and I'm standing by it, but I know everyone's experience and experience going into motherhood is completely different. So I understand why we would have different opinions on that. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I will continue answering these Q&A questions from Instagram at the end of each episode. It's just nice to add another segment and to answer the questions that you might be wondering. If you have not yet had a chance to leave me a review over in iTunes, it helps my podcast to grow so much. If you could hit that five star, maybe leave a quick review, I would appreciate it so much. Also, if you have not yet grabbed access to my resource library where you can get all of my printables and ebooks in one place, you can get that at farmhouseonboon.com slash farmhouse resources. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.